Fantastic. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our second webinar. And thank you so much to Expat Web and Tax Consulting for, for sponsoring us and really leading a lot of the, uh, the, the content and some of the intellectual thought that we're going to be talking through this morning. Uh, welcome, everybody. People are going to be joining as we start, and we will be recording this and sharing it with members afterwards. Uh, but before we jump into the webinar, uh, perhaps just give an overview of, of who the home team is here, then I'll let all the panelists introduce themselves. Uh, obviously, you'll, you'll notice Cecilia and myself from the chamber, but in mission control, we have Ema behind the scenes. who will be running some of our polling and questioning. And obviously, uh, Leslie and Venice are present and have been instrumental in putting this together. Perhaps at that point, uh, before we hand over to our sponsors, I'll let Ryan introduce himself, one of our co-panelists today. Hi, th thanks, Leon. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Ryan Ravens. I'm the Chief Executive at Accelerate Cape Town, a business leadership organization down here in the Western Cape. Thank you, Ryan. Cecilia, everybody knows you, but tell, tell us a bit about your role. So, hello, everyone. It's um, good to just see your names pop up, even though I can't see your faces, but luckily I know most of your faces already. Um, it's good to have you in the house. I'm going to be keeping my eye on the Q&A specifically from all of you today. So um, as we go through the topics today, um, can we ask that you please first come with your questions related to the specific topic we're dealing with. We might well get to some other questions that you've got at the back of your mind. So keep those for when we get to it. Otherwise, we will give some time also at the end of the webinar for anything that we haven't addressed and that you might still have. Okay. Thank you. And our, our sponsors today, it'd be great to hear from you guys as an introduction. Perhaps Marissa, starting with you. Sure. I'm Marissa Jacobs. I head up uh, immigration and mobility at Expat Web, and I will be chatting with you guys today a bit around international mobility and, and some of the impacts. Thank you. And, and, and Jerry, we've, we've worked together before, but uh, so I'm sure some of our members will remember as they will indeed, Marissa. Give us a reminder where you come into it. Thank you. Thank you, Leon. Thanks for having us. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm the managing partner of uh, Tax Consulting. Uh, we've been going for roughly 15 years. Uh, we just have 100 professionals, and I, we, 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 think, we think we're the largest independent tax tax uh, 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 business in South Africa. Of course, numbers are not so well known. Um, I'm, I'm at the moment in George. So I'm, I'm doing my lockdown in George for my families, but our business is in Joburg. But we also have quite a large George office because it makes us very effective for SARS. But at the moment, I think SARS is pretty much closed as far as, as, far as we know. So we, I know that we, we see, receive some correspondence, but they're pretty much closed. I think they must be making plans on how to make money to pay for all of this uh, once it's over. Uh, other than tax, uh, I've got some recent hobbies. I now know how to do washing, how to hang things up in a way that you don't have to iron things, you know. Uh, stuff I haven't done for about 20 years, but it, it comes back quickly. So, welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Gary. And, and thanks again to you both for, for sponsoring today. Uh, uh, much like some of the broadcasts I've been sharing and perhaps building on some of the themes from the last 12 months of our events, we really are living in strange times, you know, exponential times, VUCA times. And I, you know, I'm, I find myself staying up very late at night, watching all the news channels, listening to podcasts and live broadcasts and finding myself unexpectedly and emotionally rattled by Boris Johnson, the British prime minister, you know, being hospitalized in ICU the other night. And, you know, you might not be surprised to learn that from a political perspective, I come from a different viewpoint than Boris, but there's just so many things in the world right now that are unsettling. Uh, I can hear my domestic helper bashing away with the uh, Hoover in the background. I've got the dogs. I've got my teenage boys at home. And I think we're all having to adjust massively to being on top of each other whilst working. But each, I think what's so unsettling is the uncert uncertainty of having our fate in the hands of other people that are determining when lockdown ends and when it doesn't. Uh, and I've, I've got family all around the world. I've got family in the UK and family in France. And it's really interesting to see how, how Europe's been hit so hard. You know, sadly, over 7,000 deaths in the UK right now. 
the world's sixth largest economy, perhaps with one of the best healthcare systems in the world. France is near 9,000. Spain and Italy, it's hard to keep up. 15, 17,000 deaths so far due to COVID. Now, at the risk of sounding glib, you know, these stats I don't think are really being presented in, in, in the true light. There are 16,000 people that die a day in the UK anyway. And yesterday we had 700 people die of COVID, of which 90, 95% of those were critically ill anyway with severe underlying health issues. So I think our, our webinar series really is to kind of look at the stats and the global trends, but really deep dive into them to analyze what are the salient points coming out of those stats. And really, how do they impact us in South Africa? And how do they impact us here in your businesses? And I think that's going to be where we want to take this conversation today. So yeah, we know what's going on in the world. We can see how well Cyril has locked down, how he's been lauded as a statesman, and which again triggers the question, why can not we be so decisive around our economy 12 months ago and perhaps avoided the downgrades? Uh, we could go down that other tangent there. We can look at the paucity of leadership in the United States on a federal scale, looking at Trump, and then look at the strength of leadership in New York, uh, the complete difference. So certain things are coming out, how we view statistics, how leadership is key, uh, and why are we mobilizing so much around this one area when we've had arguably bigger challenges in South Africa to deal with? But we're going to bring that into now to say, you know, the world, you know, there is nowhere to run. You know, I was chatting with family in Europe last night and you, they're going to be shut down for a few more months. South Africa will explore how long the shutdown will be. But it's not as if we can just take all our assets and go to another region because the borders are closed and the economies are just as bad over there. So actually, we are in this world event together, which is unsettling. So I think it's really important, and again, as a chamber and as members, we can come together and lean on the expertise of our panelists and our member organizations to make sure we seize these silver linings and opportunities that present themselves. And on that, I'll perhaps introduce Ryan, who's, Ryan and I, for the last probably four or five years, Ryan, have done a series of events together where we've really been articulating and arguing for a new model of capitalism that is more inclusive and more sustainable, but equally new ways of working, uh, the ways of working that we've all had to embrace over the last 13 days. But what are you seeing specifically from a South African perspective on the macro scale? I know you've got, uh, you've got your tentacles into government and other areas, but what are the key themes and concerns emerging with, with your SA hat on? Thanks, thanks, Leon. That's a great segue. Yeah, we've been, we've been doing thought leadership for, for years around the fourth industrial revolution and new models of working and, and all of that kind of thing. I don't think any of us quite expected it to be uh, dumped on us so rapidly and so suddenly. But the reality is, you know, this is the fourth industrial revolution and it's happening right now. Um, I, I, I think, you know, as you, as you mentioned, um, President Ramaphosa has definitely stepped up. Um, I think his, his leadership, supported by Health Minister William Kizzi, has been uh, impressively decisive to date. Um, you know, I, I think there's, there's a lot of discussion around whether the lockdown was imposed too soon. Um, should we have waited a little bit longer to see the extent of, of the infection in the country and, and so on and so on. Um, but, I, but I have to be honest, my, my personal view is that the lockdown um, was implemented just in time. Um, I, I, I think um, there, there are two issues from a global best practice perspective that have, have indicated, and, and bearing in mind, look, this is all new globally for everyone. And so a lot of the data is emerging on a daily basis and we've sort of got to make sense of that. Um, but, but it does seem as if the two factors that have, have massively limited the spread of infection has been very strict lockdowns and then uh, testing on a, on a massive scale, right? Um, and, and the testing is important because it provides that the necessary data that gives us, into, gives us the insights into how the disease is spreading in a particular region, and so on, um, and, and the extent to which it's penetrating at-risk communities. Without the data, you really, all you have left is the blunt instrument of severe lockdown. And that's sort of the, the space that we're in at the moment. We simply don't know where the disease is spreading, how it's spreading, and, and so on. And because we don't know, you've got to sort of impose this harsh national lockdown. Um, and so the duration of that lockdown becomes absolutely critical. And, and you're starting to see the narrative um, where uh, President Ramaphosa is coming under immense political pressure um, to sort of not extend the lockdown beyond the 16th of April. Um, a lot of pressure coming in from mining and, and various other sectors of the economy. Um, 
and and it's a difficult one. It's a it's a really difficult call to make. Um, I, I, I think one positive that I have seen is a, a real push towards amplifying testing and, and developing a, a more comprehensive data set um, for South Africa, which I think helps us massively. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's early days yet, but the preliminary reports do seem to indicate that the rate of infection is slowing down in South Africa, which is fantastic news because that potentially indicates that we may have uh, the lockdown actually might be working. Um, and even though the lockdown is not being respected in, in many disadvantaged communities, if the disease hasn't spread into those communities, then, then it's, it's almost okay for, for those communities to continue um, uh, informal trade. You know, people have got to eat. It's, it's very difficult when you're living in an informal uh, community to sort of stay indoors and, and that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but President Ramaphosa is known for consulting quite, quite broadly and quite widely. Um, and, and the hope is that whatever decision is taken, will be based as much on sort of the scientific evidence, whatever that might be at this stage, um, as much as the need to then protect the economy. You know, the, the reality is the South African economy is already in ICU, um, and, and this could very much be the death blow. And so it's a, it's a balancing act and something which the president um, definitely is going to need to uh, get right at, at this stage. Um, but, but, you know, I, I think something that, that a lot of uh, small to medium business and, and even some of the larger businesses, you see what's happened to Edcon, um, but, but something that, that a lot of business owners and, and business leaders need to start considering is whether it would be possible to return to normal after all of this. You know, um, is, is this return to normal that everybody thinks is going to happen post um, 6th and April realistic? You know, so, so even if the lockdown is ended, um, it's, it's somewhat unlikely that we're just suddenly going to return to normal. You've got to remember there's been massive disruption and change, not only to consumer behavior, but also to supply chains. Um, and particularly where, you know, for many of your members, um, supply chain that, that, that goes across international uh, boundaries. Um, I, I, yeah. I'm not sure we just return to normal. So I think it's, it's uh, this is the new normal. And, and I think the, the best advice and, and something that, that someone sort of said to me yesterday was a, a quote from Barack Obama, which is that, um, you know, you've got to show up, dive in and, and stay at it. And, and that's sort of the mindset I think that, that entrepreneurs need to have at this stage. Um, and, and the organizations that are able to respond positively and, and adapt the quickest will, will most likely be the ones who, who have the best chance of surviving this. Thanks, thanks, Ryan. That's a, a, a nice opening. And any day we quote Barack Obama is a good day for me. <laughs> so we'll see how many we can get in there today. As you were talking, then, we've just sh shared our first poll, which would be really interesting to gauge how members are feeling about the impact of the and duration of the expected lockdown. And perhaps move on to, uh, to Marissa and Jerry, really, from what you're seeing with your clients, perhaps if we start from a visa immigration perspective, what are the immediate challenges? Then moving on to perhaps some of the, the, the second questions around some of the tax relief measures. And if I start that just by setting it up and very much echoing what Ryan was saying, we're in a period of survival. If we look at statistics of how much cash flow do businesses have to sustain themselves through a lockdown and non-trading, trading, it's quite frightening. And uh, Cecilia and I were going through the statistics from the UK last night, whereas 6% of companies have already run out of money. 64% have three months cash flow, uh, which is quite frightening. And I, I imagine those organizations are slightly better equipped than, than the South African businesses because of the, the comparative economic strengths. Uh, well, last week, we spoke about Edcon dying but much like many of the COVID victims, you know, there were significant underlying health issues there. So perhaps if you were struggling before and you were innovating slowly, you're going you're gonna to struggle to come out of this. But perhaps, Marissa, if you can actually jump in there and say, what are you seeing with your, your clients and what are the impacts of it on, on, on some of the visa implications right now? Sure. Thanks, Leon. I think from an international mobility perspective, there's definitely a couple of things that are top of mind for employers at the moment. Um, the one is, of course, around uh, their expatriate resources who are currently in country with expiring visas and expiring passports um, who were due to who were at the end of their assignments or at the end of their visa period and due to travel back home or due to renew and now are in a position where they can't. Um, there's, of course, a number of visa categories where you either because you've reached the maximum period or because the conditions don't allow you to extend where you would normally have to travel back to home country. Um, 
the Department of Home Affairs has made some concessions available and special processes whereby employers can ensure that their foreign nationals remain compliant by extending those visas, at least in the short term. So there is a lot of um, focus on that and employers looking to ensure all the expats remain fully compliant and legal. And then, of course, on the other hand, there are a lot of guys who were due to come in now in the second quarter um, to start off on new assignments and start off on new projects who now um, can't, of course, because of travel restrictions. But also, once the, once the lockdowns are lifted and travel um, restrictions are, are, are are lessened, they would of course still need to get visas to enter the country. Um, some of them might have visas that have been revoked or they previously didn't need to have visas to travel to South Africa on business who will now need visas. And what we're seeing is, is most of the South African embassies abroad are either uh, completely closed because of lockdown or they are they have less services at the moment. They're only looking after civic services or they've been assigned to, to not proceed with normal services at the moment. They're rather looking at South Africans who are stranded abroad and how to facilitate getting them back home again. Um, that's become their core function at the moment. So we are in constant communication, sometimes daily, with those embassies to make sure that um, we are preparing um, applications for people who need to urgently enter South Africa for critical projects and um, to make sure that they are ready once those embassies do open up for services again so that they are at the at, so that they get assisted first to be able to travel back to South Africa um, yeah, so that's, that's definitely um, the two items that are top of mind for employers at the moment. Um, and, and, and we're trying to facilitate that as best as we can um, with, of course, home affairs being closed at the moment and, um, and the embassies. Let's um, explore that, though. You know, I know we, we, we had a rehearsal yesterday, and I think, what are we, what are we seeing around our, our embassies being closed, home affairs being closed? Surely there should be some capacity to, to meet our taxpayers demand in terms of these, these, these critical times. Are there some good examples of what's being done or can we be critical about that, that approach? There's definitely some embassies that are still open and operating from an immigration point of view. Um, uh, some of those include Thailand, um, Burundi, Oman, who are still operating, who are still uh, accepting visa applications to come in and process those so that assignments are able to continue um, back to normal again. Um, but like I said, a lot of the embassies are, 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 are either in lockdown. So if, I, if we look at the, the embassy in London as an example, uh, close to home for your members, they are in complete lockdown at the moment. Um, I spoke to the guys yesterday and they are they're not proceeding on services at the moment at all. Um, if we look at other embassies such as uh, Kuwait, they are completely focused on how to assist South Africans who are stranded abroad and facilitate for them how to come back to South Africa. They are not looking um, at visa processes at the moment. So I think in the coming days as, as uh, lockdowns might get lifted depending on the World Health Organization policies, we'll see um, some plans starting to get made to address that backlog and to address uh, the need for expats to start traveling back to South Africa and, and, and for, for projects to continue and the economy to, to, to start again. Yeah. Thanks, Marissa. I, obviously, and we have insights into a lot of the British nationals that are stranded and our consulate staff are they're all working from home, they're available. Uh, again, if anyone has any challenges or people know who are struggling, you can direct them our way. But uh, I think what has been a challenge is actually getting people expatriated back to their own country because with the, with the flights shut down. Mm -hmm. I know there are seven flights, charter flights booked to leave South Africa, but you've mm -hmm. got to get to Joburg or Cape Town, which if you're in KwaZulu-Natal or the Eastern Cape can be quite challenging, uh, some of the holiday destinations down there. Uh, yeah. And I've, I have seen our High Commissioner, Nigel Casey, regularly communicating through his Instagram and Twitter to make people aware of what's going on. But uh, one would hope that all embassies and home affairs departments and SARS departments were, were navigating this crisis by making themselves available. What, what's your experience of that been, Jerry, with that, perhaps from a SARS perspective? 
Thank you, Leon. Well, I mean, they, uh, they obviously come out of the blocks very quickly to, um, to, to, to make some tax announcements. Uh, and they've, they've, they've broadly positioned their tax announcements, I think, in, in pretty much four areas. Uh, the the first one is expansion of that employment tax incentive scheme. Um, we basically, in the past, if you earned less than six and a half thousand a month, you you and you were between I think eighteen and twenty seven, you would be able to qualify for the ETI. And they that 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 but you can only claim it for two years. And what they've done is, is to say for the next four months, if you've got any employee that earns basically below six and a half thousand a month, we're going to give you 500 bucks per employee per month for four months. So basically there's four times 500 is 2000 bucks for any person that you employ that's in the payroll system in good standing that earns less than six and a half a month. So, you know, it, 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 it's very wide relief and it's very immediate relief because it's given through as a payroll, as a payroll uh, credit. And they also said they're gonna give those, pay those refunds out enough where you don't have enough payers to earn to pay. So I think that was quite a, um, that's a wide sweeping um, announcement. And I think it's a good announcement, but of course it, 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 it's kind of fixing a problem where the guys are already compliant. You know, they didn't yeah. use this opportunity to, to, to try and pull the informal sector where we know there's a massive informal sector out there, which is the cash economy often, that, yeah. that it's a big issue around the tax compliance around those, those entities that's trading. And some of them are making a lot of money. Uh, yeah. You know, they, they, they it obviously don't apply to the informal sector. But it's something that if you've got somebody less than six and a half thousand in, in your employment, um, even if they're in their fifties, even if they've been with you for a long time, you can give them immediate tax relief. And obviously you claim that when you do your, your EMP 201, which is basically your reconciliation of your pay as you earn per month. And the first one is, is due by the, by the, by the seventh of, of, uh, uh, of, of, of May. So obviously how it works is that your, your month runs, the month ends end of April, and then within seven days after that month, then you file your 201 and you pay your pay as you earn. Um, yeah. So there's, there's a very clear relief. The, the other two reliefs that they've announced, um, you know, basically in, in, in broad terms, those other two reliefs that they've announced was to say that you don't have to pay all your employees tax for a smaller or medium sized business. Um, so you, you can pay a lower amount of employees tax. Uh, I'm not really going to go through the, through the detail of, of, of that lower amount of pays you earn, um, because it, it is, it is in my view, uh, incredibly dangerous thing to do. You know, if you, if you don't have the money and you have to borrow pays you earn to keep alive, you the, the the question is from from a business perspective should you be paying people that money in the first place if you don't have the tax to pay but remember this is not a relief it's just a deferral uh so it's going to come and catch you up later and where are you going to make the money to catch up later on this and what if that employee then then leaves your employment and you still have a historical ability to pay them so our view to clients have always been, and I mean, we don't have that many small, small businesses as clients, but a lot of medium sized businesses is if you can't afford, if you cannot afford to, to, to pay people, it, don't pay them full and pay over 80% pay as you earn, rather reduce their salaries and, and pay them the amount you can afford. Um, yeah. Jerry, perhaps uh, I'd really like to explore that in more detail. But maybe take a quick pause. Uh, I think yep. that's going to be very salient and relevant to a lot of us. Uh, yep. Before we do that, Cecilia, perhaps are we getting any poll results or questions come in on this area? You're just on mute there, Cecilia. Yeah. Hi. Um, so I think if we can address sort of some of the um, some of the 
things that uh, Jerry's just brought up, um, and I want to bring in the results of the first poll on how long people think this lockdown is still going to last and taking into account the recovery. Most of you said six months, followed by, no, sorry, most of you said 12 months, 39% of you. 29% of you went for six months, and then third up was permanent. <laughs> Um, so wow. that's quite interesting. Wow. And then um, when I'm listening to Jerry saying relief versus deferred, then it, it does bring up the question when it comes to tax and the way forward, what are people going to do if this is a six month or a 12 month or a permanent thing? I think our whole tax structure might have to be rewritten, re-looked at. Um, it also something that, that Ryan brought up yesterday was the fulfillment of contracts and contractual obligations, force majeures now coming in, an act of God, what, what could these possible implications be for us if this is permanent or if it's only just for a year? Thanks, Cecilia. I mean, firstly, 12 months. I thought we were an optimistic bunch in the British Chamber, but clearly we're a bunch of realists. I, I just think there are the th three excellent kind of segues you just introduces there to to see this. So maybe we could take Jerry and Ryan on those, on those areas. Yeah. Sorry, Jerry, go on. Sorry. So, yeah, good. Uh, so Lynn, you want me to comment on those, on those, those on the poll or kind of move along on? I, I think if we just talk to the poll in terms of if we are, the majority yeah. saying six months, you know, a fifth of us are saying a year. Yes. You know, in terms of uh, in terms of our tax planning, mm -hmm. our our business planning, uh, sure. what what are we looking at? What should we be considering here? Well, we we we've we've seen, and again, I'm I'm, I'm I must be very careful that I I, I I can only comment on things I see and know. Uh, yeah. So we, for example, look after probably a couple of large tour operators, probably the one of the larger ones, independently owned. You know that brings tourists from Europe to, to, to South Africa. And their CEO has told me, you can write off this whole year. You're only going to see tourists in January again. Um, lockdown or no lockdown, that's when the tourists are going to, 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 to when it's going to happen. Uh, they survive as a business because they get an interest-free loan from the government to support them during this period. But... He basically says he, you know, whilst we're okay, we're very worried about all the establishments, all the restaurants, all the tour operators, the bus operators that that used to to transport UK, British, whatever tourists around. These guys are simply not going to come. Um, and I say that the tourism industry operates in a cycle. So guys literally save and plan for their their holiday on a certain period. And we're definitely going to miss the, 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 the key busy periods in South Africa. So guys are literally going to postpone it till, until next year. So that's going to have a massive impact on our economy. And it's going to run straight through. Uh, we've got clients in the motor manufacturing industry uh, that provide parts globally, which literally from top to bottom have said all 7,000 employees take a 50% pay cut from this month onwards, until further notice. Uh, and I mean, I basically was called into a board meeting on that to, to explain that and the rationale. Nobody wants to do it, but this is purely a question of survival. You know, if that, if, 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 if that business is, you know, that, that, that business is where it is, and, and, and that's what it needs to do to, to, to look after shareholders and ensure that there is a business to come back to afterwards. Um, so I, I, I kind of agree with the, perm, with the 12 months to permanent um, because there definitely will be a new normal after this, you know, in, 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 in some or other way in terms of, of how people conduct business. And I think certain industries will definitely be, 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 be permanently impacted by this perhaps just becoming more agile or, or more careful before they commit now that they know that something like this might happen. Um, the general census, I think, for all clients, even our own businesses, is, listen, guys, X months will be okay. 
you know, if it goes into that month, we're going to take a bit of strain. But all of us has got a breaking point. Every, every single person on this call has got a breaking point. Every single industry has got a breaking point, you know, where you get to a point where you say, listen, I, I just can't do it anymore. Uh, and then, of course, we've got clients complete on the other side of the scale, uh, which, which, which provides oxygen, where they're having hotly debated topics where what staff, what part of their staff they want to lay off in a certain division because there's no prospects of making money there. And the other ones, they're talking about how do we quantify special allowance uh, or extra overtime and shift allowances to pay some of our other staff that yeah. literally needs to come in and work all those hours to, to keep supplying hospitals. Um, so I guess with every crisis, there's, there's certain things that go away and it's other opportunities that, that, that open up from a reward perspective. Thanks, Joe. The members will just see another poll coming up there that would be great for the, everybody yeah. to kind of respond to. Anything you want to jump in there with Cecilia before we hand over to Ryan? Just, um, we, we had another brief poll just asking members who was making use of tax relief measures that have been put forward by government. Um, actually, quite a large number of you, almost 40% answered yes. Um, no at 54%. And this is just, we've been in this for less than a month, I'm aware of. So that's my first thought. If this goes to six months and 12 months, um, I don't think a single one would not go for that option. Amanda did point out, though, I think there are some restrictions to the tax relief only comes in for salaries less than six and a half thousand grand a month. Um, correct me. Yeah, that's right, Jerry. Absolutely. So She's spot on. So for a, a quite a large part of our workforce though, and for our members companies, that means that there effectively won't be any tax relief. Um, so we're trying to, the government is, and possibly rightly so, um, trying to protect those who are already on a low income scale. But this, you know, it does leave quite a large gap open um, for all of the other salary earners there and for the companies who somewhere have to take a hit and somewhere have to dig up the money and protect their employees. Um, Ryan, I don't know what, what your opinion might be on how do people get through this, and especially since we don't know when the end will be. Yeah, um, I, I mean, I think it's a, it's a difficult one. I, I fully agree with Jerry and most of the respondents. Um, the, the economic disruption will certainly persist long beyond um, the lockdown period. And, um, and I think it's going to be very much sector dependent as well. You know, if you, if you look at the Western Cape, um, sort of the key, the four key sectors down here are, are hospitality, so your tourism um, uh, and hospitality industry, um, agriculture, uh, professional services, and then the retail. Um, and if, if you sort of look at those, um, I, I, I have to be honest, you know, I think consumer behavior is going to change substantially um, yeah. uh, from a tourism perspective following this. You know, it, it, I mean, just ask yourself, even if there was an all clear tomorrow, would you be inclined to travel anywhere and, and uh, would you feel comfortable going to restaurants and mingling with other people and, and all of that kind of thing? So I, I just think consumer behavior in the hospitality sector is going to fundamentally change um, yeah. permanently. Um, and and that, that I think is something that hospitality operators, tourism companies and so on really need to take very seriously. Um, and they are going to need to very rapidly adapt their value proposition to the market and, and sort of how they create value for people um, uh, and, and I think the survival depends on it. The flip side of that, however, is professional services. You know, I, I imagine um, lawyers are going to be very busy, particularly very. come the end of this month when uh, force majeure and all of that starts kicking in. Uh, and, and bear in mind, you know, even, even if the lockdown has been released and all of that, there's going to be a lot of legal issues to, to sift through and wade through post this, you know, contracts that haven't been fulfilled, knock-on impacts in supply yeah. chains and, and all of that kind of thing. Um, and so, so that's going to, to really uh, be looked at. From an agri perspective, you know, globally, there's a lot of new legislation and regulations being applied in terms of how to sanitize goods. Um, and that yeah. introduces additional processes and, and things that, that many uh, players in that space are going to need to seriously consider from a packaging perspective, a distribution perspective, and, and all of that kind of stuff. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's sort of what I was saying earlier, that, that, that people need to accept that this has been a step change in the way the world does business. And um, this notion of things sort of returning to the way they were 
um, you know, it's, it's highly unlikely. And so the sooner entrepreneurs and businesses are able to adapt and respond to this, I think um, the better. And, and there are opportunities, you know, make no mistake, there's, there's going to be significant pain um, as we sort of rip off this Band-Aid on the old way of doing things. Um, but as we all know, 4IR and new business models and new ways of doing things also have significant opportunity. Um, and, and I think at this stage, it's, it's going to be really difficult um, as leadership and as business leaders um, to, to really, you know, steady the ship and, and be that positive sort of influence on the rest of the staff. But I think that is absolutely what's required at this stage. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, I'm going to come back to a couple of those themes you just raised, but perhaps coming back to Jerry and, and listening to the poll that Cecilia just shared with us, 50% making use of those tax breaks, but then really exploring it, looking at actually salaries below 6,500, which probably isn't the, uh, the, the median demographic of our members. And also chatting to our accountants yesterday, talking about a lot of the relief is just for BEE or black owned companies. Uh, do you have any, any observations or comments on that in terms of what is available that can help our members navigate this three, six, 12 month permanent situation? And then but perhaps, you know, a, an unofficial opinion on what, what could be done to, to make, it, make it better that we could perhaps use our advocacy role to influence. You, Jerry, yeah. Yes, you. <laughs> Me, okay. <laughs> our tax um, expert. Well, the, the, uh, I mean, the, 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 the commentary to the law is until the 15th of, of April on these, new, these four new laws. Um, I mean, I, the, the problem you really have is that, that SARS is already how, how many billion behind collection target before all of this. Uh, Reserve Bank talks about a potential 4% smaller economy after all of this. Um, so they have to juggle in terms of, of where do they, what do they do? I mean, we've, I've seen a proposal by, by, I think it was NetLAC that they sent to members yesterday uh, on certain proposals that they want to do about extending the grant system, you know. But again, it's all money that, that, that needs to flow. And, and we're, already in, we're already in a tight spot before this crisis. So I, I think at an at a advocacy level, whatever you ask for, there's, there's a downside on the other end. Um, I personally believe, you know, as an association, you should really ma make sure that or help your members to survive. And I think we, are, we should be in a survival state. Even if you don't feel it, that can change very quickly. Uh, I fully agree with, with Amanda that commented that you don't borrow money to pay your pay as you earn. I mean, that is just, you, you will literally uh, 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 obliterate your business if you do that. Uh, I don't believe that you, you should make use of the deferment of, of, of paying pay as you earn over because you're just setting yourself up for, for, for failure later on. You should rather reduce salaries. I do believe there's a number of tax breaks that, that people need to relook or just go relook at those fundamental tax breaks, which we can deal with in terms of tax breaks for working from home, for being provided with company cell phones and company connectivity, uh, transport services and stuff that's been provided. I think you, you're absolutely entitled to, to, to claim those things from a tax perspective if your agreements are and your policies are correctly structured. Um, and then I think the, 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 the other question that I've got is, is, is they're also announcing relief from a corporate tax perspective to say that there's a bit of relief that you, I mean, that's one of the proposals that's out to say that you, you could defer your provisional tax statements or provisional tax payments. Um, but I mean, do you, do you really, I mean, how many small or medium company, sized companies are going to pay uh, uh, provisional tax in a period where where there's you know when when kind of survival is at stake uh, you 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 need to think very very carefully if you let that cash flow go uh, on the one hand and on the other hand if afterwards you 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 find that this I've actually underestimated my provisional tax I'm supposed to have paid more there are legal ways of approaching SARS and say, listen, I want to please correct this without um, 
without paying penalties and interest. Um, but I, I think from a SaaS perspective, um, they're going to be on even more collection pressure when all of this is over. And they're going to have to really up their game in terms of, 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 of collecting taxes. Um, because if it's between, you know, it's, I, I don't want to change the discussion, but I think it was hugely valuable yesterday for me when I asked Ryan, um, does, does he think we have a security concern? You know, when it comes to survival, between the taxman and, and putting food on the table or keeping my, my business alive, uh, you you pick keeping your business alive, and and that that's not that's not irresponsible. I think the one item we discussed yesterday is VAT. That you must be very careful on VAT. You know because VAT is the one item where you collect tax on behalf of SARS. You are SARS's agent. So if you send a, a hundred invoice out, you add a fifteen percent VAT to that. That is SARS's money. That's not your money. And basically, by taking that money and using it in your business, that's basically stealing. So there's no relief on that. Uh, one of the weaknesses of VAT, of course, is that you you it works on an invoice basis. So please don't send out invoices now with VAT on it that's not being paid because SARS will hold you accountable for that VAT, even though you've not had the cash flow. So you, you're going to be have, have to be very, very careful in terms of, of, of what you do now. And typically, like with tax, it might sound like a good idea to do it now, but it's not going to look like a good, year, a good idea 18 months from now when you get a SARS auditor that, that comes in trying to collect more money and he can find a timing difference between, between when you invoiced or not. You know, if you're unsure about your invoices, raise credit notes, make agreements with guys. Are you going to pay me? If you can pay me, great, then I'll pay my VAT. If you can't pay me, you might be better off just to issue a credit note and enter into some sort of a, a, a compromise. You know, we don't really want to talk debt compromise because we're not going to, you know, we still think you're going to pay. You just have cash flow problems of your own. But these are the type of discussions that people should have with their accountants to make sure that they do it legally whilst remaining on the right side of the law. Thanks, thanks, Jerry. And I think that might trigger, perhaps if the, the audience have any specific questions around that tax management piece that we could answer now or follow up. Sorry, Cecilia, do you want to jump in there? Yeah, I think there was one from Andrew Glendening in Cape Town. Um, Jerry, I think you might have touched on some of this already, but Andrew's coming from a startup perspective saying, is the tax relief only for companies who have to lay off or furlough people? And what about companies with delayed turnover as a result of COVID and who are trying to keep their employees through a temporary downturn due to COVID? Well, I mean, I, I think if, you, if you're talking from a startup perspective, you obviously are a smaller or medium-sized business. Yeah. Uh, so this, this relief, as far as, as the... the um, the employment tax incentive is concerned. So this is the one where, where uh, Amanda has has quite correctly indicated that it's of absolute no use for you if you're paying people above uh, six and a half thousand a month. Uh, but but it it otherwise applies to 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 pretty much everyone. Um, so there's nothing specifically for startups in, in, in the ETI relief, and there's nothing specifically otherwise for ETI for sport startups uh, under under any of the other relief provisions as well. Um, and again, if if Andrew were to ask, I think they've hastened this legislation through very quickly. I would agree with that. Uh, the drafting of the law is it's not good work. Uh, the explanatory memorandum and the actual law itself contradicts one another in a couple of places, especially around the employee benefit trust, which or the trusts, which I'll talk about later. Um, I don't think their their focus was start up relief. Now I think their focus was let's give a, keep try to keep alive what it's what okay. is there at the moment. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I I think perhaps. I'd, I'd invite the audience to perhaps ask some more specific tax questions. I know 
from we run a small organization at the chamber and we have other interests and it's been really interesting like do we pay our vat bill should we be paying our corporation tax and a, a lot of you might have questions in this very safe space so please fire those up while we're doing that perhaps if we come back to jerry's segue to, related to a conversation we had yesterday in our rehearsal really around the kind of strategic implications structural implications around the broader security challenges you know, I think the first role of any, most of you know I'm an old soldier and principles of war survival comes first. Every year when I'm doing my business plan, I think with a survivalist mentality, how do I survive before I thrive? And a, a lot of us are probably having to adopt that mindset right now. So surviving means, yeah, it means being able to keep my lights on, feed my family, pay my employees. And I suppose the nature of our economy, the much of it being informal, relying on SMEs to employ informal workers as well that are now shut down. What are we feeling of the kind of societal implications, Ryan? Uh, should the lockdown continue beyond where we are now? I mean, I, I have my own views and concerns, but I'd welcome yours with perhaps a lens on Kailicha and uh, Google Etu from a Western Cape perspective. Yep, absolutely. I think this is a very, very serious consideration for South Africa. Obviously, our, our circumstance is very different to Europe uh, and the States and, and places like that. Um, but, but we see the strain even somewhere like Italy is, is under at the moment where people are struggling to feed their families. Um, so you can well imagine what that means in a place like Kalicha or, or any of our informal uh, settlements. The, the sad reality is our government doesn't have much in its arsenal to defend us against this uh, economically. Um, you know, the, the reality is the coffers have been depleted and there's not really much that government can do. Um, also with, with um, us being downgraded to junk at, at the worst possible time, government's ability to borrow additional funds is also going to be significantly constrained going forward. So I, I think the, the first sort of mindset that, that entrepreneurs need to uh, accept is that there's not going to be some sort of uh, knight in shining armor uh, coming from government to rescue us in, in any way. I mean, uh, we've seen some broad-based relief for smaller businesses and, and people earning below 6,500, um, but, but that's not going to help vast majority of, of sort of the people on this call and, and many of the, the businesses um, you know, sort of medium-sized businesses and that kind of thing who probably, I think someone commented that their, their lowest paid employee was, was 20,000 per month. Um, yeah. And there's very little that government is able to do to assist from that perspective, you know. Um, and I think we, what, what concerns me is sort of the scenes that we saw playing out in, in the Joburg and Pretoria CBDs last year, where you sort of had these rampant mobs of people, um, you know, running through the CBDs and looting and, and that kind of thing. Um, some, some reports I've had from, from the police special forces people and so on deployed into these townships um, are that the unrest has already started. I, be, I believe a clinic was burnt in Kailicha um, a couple of days yeah. ago, which is just mind boggling. But, but this is the South African way, right? When, when, uh, when, when we protest transport infrastructure, we burn our trains. When we protest fees must fall, we burn our libraries. And, and when we uh, protest the lockdown, we burn our clinics, right? So, um, this sadly is, is the South African mindset, and it's, it's very concerning. There, there are very stark realities for people living in those communities who are living very much from hand to mouth on a daily basis. Um, and, and when you sort of start saying to those people, well, now you've got to stay indoors and all the stores are closed, um, you know, you, you, you've got to weigh up, you know, you've mentioned the survivalist mindset, but actual survival of, of having to feed your family every day versus being told by the police that you've got to stay indoors, um, this, is, this is very real. I mean, a, a statistic that, that really struck me was um, just at the start of the lockdown, when we had, I think at that point, two deaths from coronavirus, we imposed this lockdown, and at the end of the month, people went and collected their SASAR grants, and because of the, the lockdown and the fact that those queues were now substantially longer, we had two people die in the queue waiting for their SASAR grants. So that really puts things into perspective for you about the realities um, between sort of your, your middle and upper class South African minority, uh, which is probably most of the people on this call, versus the vast majority of South Africans who are living in, in dire um, poverty and, and, and really adverse conditions. Um, so, so, you know, I, I, I think um, the prospect of, of mass civil unrest is very real. Um, and, yeah. and, and I think this is one of the factors that the president is going to need to consider very, very carefully um, when he sort of considers whether there should be an extended lockdown or, or anything like that. 
Um, something that I was reading this morning, which potentially could be a solution for South Africa is a continued lockdown, but with um, uh, lesser restrictions. So you sort of lock down people to a specific area, you know, and, and, and that's possible if you've managed to test substantially and you have a bit of data from that area and you're fairly comfortable that sort of this community is, is relatively um, clean, you, you could allow some movement within that community and allow th that sort of township business um, to continue and, and the informal sector to, to, to get going again. Um, but, but it still begs the question as to where are all those informal laborers and all of those people actually going to get income from um, to support all of that informal business? Yeah. So thanks, it's a steady thanks, prospect. It's, a, it's an it is. steady prospect. And I think we're going to explore that. And thanks for setting the context. I can just see our, our chairman and uh, president of Africa, mm. the G4S, has put his hand up. And Mel, you've probably got some insights into this. Did, was there anything you'd like to comment on? Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, good morning, everyone. So um, just to add a bit of color to what Ryan was saying there, what we're finding from our customer base is indeed protection of supply chain. Um, as you know, we, we look after, let's call it cash and high value assets around Africa, South Africa included. But what we are seeing is food supply chain is coming under threat from attack and uh, trucks in transportation are now being being hit. So we're, we're supporting our customers with that. The point you raise around retail is is very real. Um, the issue of of protecting retail and um, the potential for there to be a higher level of society attack on on retail because the the threat is is very real. A lockdown, you know, the the, the tension is between the economic issues and that the health of our citizens right and yeah. the two are intention for sure and it, lockdown works well for a certain number of us i see us all sat here in our homes uh, that's great when you live eight or nine to a, a room and you use a public conveniences etc lockdown doesn't really seem to be that applicable and we're aware of the the issues that you know that is raising so from a security company perspective we're working extremely hard with our predictive analytics teams to understand where the hotspots are going to start to arise. And interestingly, the transport infrastructure, the rail infrastructure is being hit for just removal of assets. Telco companies where their, their base stations have high value assets in them, generators, batteries, solar panels, all become attractive for the criminal element during this time. And um, Pre, prior to the lockdown, we saw a significant heightened amount of threats on our customers because unfortunately the, the criminal element had their business continuity plan in place as well and um, yeah. were increasing their activity. So it's a, it's a very real situation um, to consider and what we're aware of is that the, the pressure on, the, on society will in effect raise the activity of certain criminal element for sure um, and it's and it's then for a company to understand how are their threats changing particularly you know you you will have seen if you've been able to travel for any reason in the in the in the city the majority of car dealerships have removed all their stock away to, to safe haven those sort of things you know it's locking down your your high commodity items um particularly so yeah from a from a putting color to as what Ryan was saying, it, it is a real issue for sure. And, and Mel, with your predictive analytics team and perhaps some of your G2 intelligence assets, what, what's the view in terms of length of lockdown, length of this crisis period? Uh, we won't uh, quote I, I you, think, but what are your insights? Uh, it would be inappropriate for me to, to state. I mean, some, some sources say that the lockdown will be extended. I really don't know. I think, um, as we've discussed on this call, uh, an extended lockdown will put a significant amount of our community under pressure. Yeah. Okay, significant. And, and how does that operate? Um, what we're looking at as a business is what is the post lockdown phase? How does that work? We're fortunate that we're an essential service. So we're working with our customers. Um, you know, we see certain sectors rapidly increasing security, mining sector as an example. The mine may be mothballed, but the threats to the mine then become significant. Um, so uh, 
I really don't know. Um, I, I, I think to speculate would be difficult because I think it's a, it's a very difficult course to navigate. Um, but undoubtedly, we are nowhere near the, um, the point of um, highest level of infections, etc., that you're seeing in some of the European countries. I think the lockdown happened early, quite rightly. Um, but what does that mean when you let the brakes off? Do you then need to leave it off for a while, bring it back on? Do you allow a certain amount of community or workforce back into to work, keep the shielded part of the community at risk um, under lockdown? I, I really wouldn't want to speculate, uh, Leon, but I think it's yeah. likely, as we've discussed here, is there's going to be a phase post lockdown where all businesses are going to try and understand what does that, this mean for them and what does it mean for their supply chain and customer chain accordingly. Oh, th thanks, Mel. Thank you. Thanks for that insight. It's, uh, and I think the broader kind of existential question that, that Ryan is essentially posing and Jerry has touched upon is, you know, what is the role of a business? You know, if you go by an MBA textbook definition, the role of a business is to create value for its shareholders. And we very much had the hypothesis as a chamber when, when we started changing things say, about 15 months ago was around the role of a business should be to create value for the society in which it serves and operates. And as a consequence, the shareholders will derive value from that. But I think now we really have to start exploring that because on the previous webinar, when we had uh, John Foster Pedley from Henry Business School saying, you know, we are gonna need the economy to be activated to survive and come out of this crisis. So decisions we make now perhaps need to look more broadly, broadly than on our immediate shareholders. You might've seen some of the debate around Liverpool Football Club you know, one of the wealthiest football clubs in the world. I'm, I'm, as you all know, I'm from Manchester, so I don't particularly like them. But they were actually taking government taxpayers' money to pay their staff when you have a series of multi-billionaire and billion, millionaire players and owners. And it's amazing how society turned on them. They changed their view, where other football clubs are saying, we're going to pay for all our own staff. We're going to take voluntary 30% pay cuts and keep things running. And, and many of our footballers are contributing to uh, COVID, the National Health Service, and other funds. So in terms of uh, we need a knight in shining armor, uh, we do. And I think business can step up and be that knight in shining armor to some extent in terms of we've seen the Mosepi family, the Ruperts, the, the Oppenheimers, generating, donating huge amounts of cash to make sure that our society can survive. So perhaps that's quite a high polluting concept. If we bring that down and finesse it to what we can do as businesses. Jerry, what would be your top tips from a kind of tax management, sustaining your workforce properly legally over the next three, six, nine months? And again, perhaps, perhaps before we jump into that, Cecilia, have any questions mm -hmm. come up around tax relief or what our members are looking for specific answers? No, not, not so much on the tax topic, um, Leon. So I think if we can maybe um, we can maybe close off with a few comments from Jerry um, and then get into some more some more thinking ways um, I think a lot of members are thinking around what um, what Ryan touched on with consumer behavior that will change probably in a permanent way and particularly in the hospitality industry um, I'm personally wondering what knock-on effect that might have again when it comes to what we're doing to our systems. Um, we know a very, very clean society leads to more autoimmune diseases. Um, again, antibacterial, resistant, things like that. So immediately when I hear we're gonna be even cleaner, I'm thinking along those lines. It would have actually been very cool to have a, a medical expert here as well. Faye was asking about our opinion on herd immunity. So I think there's, um, there's some questions around that, but before we get to all of that, and um, maybe just back to Jerry on um, on some key points. Yeah, how, how, do, how do our members survive the next three, six, nine months from maximizing tax efficiency, compliance, and then perhaps some of your clients having to reduce workforce numbers? What are the legal implications and, and advice around that? Yeah. Um, well, I'm, I'm not a labor expert, so I can't take you really through all the, you know, the, the, the legal steps that they do. Um, and obviously, the the any anybody that's ever dealt with the UIF and tried to get a payout or a claim from them would know it's it's uh, it it might sound easy, but it it, it it's very tough. Um, I think from a business perspective, 
what we see with clients is cash flow is absolutely critical. You're not going to get through this if you don't have cash flow, you know. Um, I think you, because of the uncertainty of the crisis, you, you, would, you would far rather uh, uh, not pay people or put them on lower pay or then, then to pay money that you don't have because we simply don't know how long this thing is going to have an impact on our businesses. Uh, we've certain, seen certain clients putting people on, on forced unpaid leave. We've seen, seen certain companies forcing people to go on leave now because you are on leave because we want, you, you can't do your normal December being business. You know, we, we, we need to make money later on in the year. So we see a lot of adjustments from corporates around this to, to just buy time. And I think the, that, that is the right strategies because we do not know how long this is going to, to last and we do not know what the impact of this is going to be. So you protect what you can now. Um, and I think my personal caveat is just be, be, be very careful of SARS. I mean, um, there's, there's, there's court case after court case that, 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 that SARS wins. Uh, uh, the courts are not very, uh, uh, SARS sits with a far greater than 60% win-loss ratio against taxpayers. Uh, and I mean, the fact that, that everything else is in lockdown doesn't mean that, that, that the courts and some of the judgments are in lockdown. We've actually seen a couple of, 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 lock, of, of court cases coming through, um, you know, being, being basically published, uh, you know, quite recently. Uh, the, 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 most, the most recent one of that was of the Supreme Court of Appeal uh, that dealt with, with uh, Diageo. Uh, which is, of course, a very well-known brand, which is delivered on the 3rd of April, um, which concerns VAT and the transactions around VAT in, 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 in a multi-jurisdictional context. So I, I just think people need to make sure that they stay on the right side of the law, uh, absolutely protect cash flow. And of course, for a lot of us, staff is, 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 a, big, is, is, a, big, um, is a big expense. Uh, my my view is it's a it's a very very tough call to start cutting people's livelihoods, you know. But but you you're better off rather rather deferring certain payments to later until you know the impact than spending money and and that might cost you your business. Thanks, Jerry. Uh, and I think perhaps I'm going to plant a seed with, with Marissa and then j just ask a question before we move back to to, to Ryan and some of their more existential questions around the new models of capitalism. But uh, I, I suppose the future of travel, Marissa, perhaps we could ask the audience, uh, or the audience could give views on when do they anticipate traveling again? And are you seeing it as, as something, the reduction in travel beyond the tourism sector, something that's really impacting your, your clients in their ability to continue as business as usual? I'm thinking of expat families stuck in three or four different countries and they can't be together and obviously they can't run their businesses. What are you seeing there? Yeah, there's definitely some impact in terms of um, expats being able to move and um, being separated from their families. Uh, we had an interview yesterday um, on 702 where there was a number of callers who called in and who are experiencing exactly those difficulties. Um, so there's definitely going to be that impact and, and, and even if the lockdown is lifted, the travel restrictions will probably in some sense still remain, especially on the high and medium risk countries. And um, I mean, we had the conversation, I think yesterday or the day before around what will, what will visa applications look like in the future? Will people need to have some kind of health passport to show um, uh, yeah. that they've been tested for COVID and, and or that they've had it before and they're immune? Um, so there's definitely some, some interest around that. Um, in, in, in the sort of six to 12 month term, the, the, the need for, for skills within businesses will remain. The fact that you've needed um, critical skills within your company for, for 
certain projects or for certain roles that will not go away because of this. So we there's definitely a, a quieting down now, but but that will pick up again, um, and certainly around big projects in in South Africa and across Africa. Um, so we are seeing from a practical perspective a lot of a lot of businesses are going into planning phase now, planning um, to get everything up and running, ready to go, so that as soon as um, as the new normal emerges, um, things can continue and, and, and those resources can start moving around again. Where, where are you seeing the plans being uh, prioritised? Are there certain regions in Africa or the world that you're seeing levels of interest for? I think it's across, it, it depends on industry and depends on sort of the, the, the big multinationals and, 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 um, and so on, but there's definitely from a, from a corporate visa perspective, for example, um, large businesses who are doing these large corporate visas for big groups of people moving in, the Department of Labor is still working. Um, so even though the Department of Home Affairs are, are, are on reduced capacity and some of the embassies are closed, the Department of Labor is still working and consulting and, and looking at those large, large applications. So we, we're still working with a couple of multinationals and, and bigger groups on, on those applications. Um, so there's still some movement in the market currently. That's good to hear. And perhaps a good opportunity for us to just launch our expat poll now. And I believe, Mel, did you want to jump in and say something there let me uh, just take you off sorry no i i think i left my hand I <laughs> said, I'm, I'm good thanks so Ema, if you perhaps send I, out I the say, sorry point. just say something if yeah. i could um for those of yeah. you that do have businesses that are like essential services the biggest challenge across africa and africa has been transportation of employees um you know, on, the, on day one of the lockdown, we had to move 15,000 employees to their place of work, which is not always easy when the informal transport process was, was actually shutting down. Um, and that's going to be an ongoing challenge for, for us. We're seeing, talking about international travel and expats traveling, but our actual workforce is being able to travel is not easy in this environment. Um, and there are so many knock-on effects with travel restrictions, even for the, the smaller organizations and entities, and for people at the, in some of the most basic workforce roles. Thanks, Matt. Yeah. Perhaps you could let me know when, I can't see the poll, let me know when the poll results are, are out, or indeed, are there any comments coming up or questions on, oh, there we go. Yeah. Can everybody everybody see that? Yeah, I'm looking at it. So that's quite a that's quite a big percentage of um of our members here today um who are employing foreigners in South Africa. Yeah. Be interesting to see about what yeah, there's about 80% who say that they are, are being impacted now or will be impacted yeah. in the future. Yeah. Indeed, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, go on, Jerry, uh, you want to jump in there? Yes, uh, thank you, Leona. Um, yeah, I think uh, if I make a comment about the huge impact on top three management consulting firms who employ expats, yeah. uh, yeah. She's absolutely right. Uh, I know one of the one of the big four firms. Um, uh, I think is retrenching over two hundred of their staff. Uh, so it's definitely in professional services across the board. Um, I've got I've got how many queries from expats that is not able to make their sixty one days outside South Africa because they 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 rushed back to South Africa. Uh, to 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 rather have lockdown here, uh, but I also know a lot of mines in Africa that are applying. Those mines themselves have basically got into lockdown, you know, because they 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 they, they want to remain safe. Uh, but we've had some mines that literally had had uh, emergency beds and stuff flown into the location to 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 to, to, to take care of that. And then, of course, the issue is what, what if you're forced 
be, because of the lockdown to overstep a time limit and then become tax resident or don't qualify for a relief. Uh, will there be any SARS relief on that? Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure the answer to that is no. Uh, I, 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 I mean, I'll be very surprised if, they, if they're going to get that relief because the problem with that relief is it cuts both ways. If, if I'm going to give the relief to a guy that is in South Africa longer than what he's supposed to be, uh, how do I then balance the scale by taxing someone else that's outside South Africa longer than what they were supposed to be? Um, it also impacts even, yep. even you know, certain large corporates that sit with the international mobile workforce that got dual employment contracts. Uh, you know, we, we, Guys have to attend directors' meetings and stuff like that in foreign countries who now can't go there. So it's, it's, got, it's got quite complex corporate tax issues. But I yeah. don't think one should philosophize about those things too much. We'll, we'll see how it plays out. And you'll, you'll deal with it in accordance. At the moment, realities, you can't move. Yeah. yeah. I think as we enter the final 15 minutes and after, of this rich conversation, uh, uh, perhaps could ask Ryan to kind of comment on some of these future scenarios, essentially the more philosophical, you know, what is the role of business in the future? What is that new normal going to look like? Where are the silver linings that we can embrace? And while we're doing that, please feel free to fire up any questions now that you've been bursting to get out there and we'll, we'll try and respond to them. And we'll also be sending out a follow-up survey for any key specific questions for, for expat web and tax consulting that we'll then address in, a, in a, another webinar in a, in a week or so. But I think perhaps Ryan, look, let's look at this. Take it back to the macro stratospheric space. What is what? What is the new world of work? What are the new paradigms of capitalism going to look like coming out of this? Firstly, I mean, I, I need to just agree with Jerry um, on what he was saying earlier. In the current scenario, I think what every business should be doing right now is making every effort to reduce all expenditure. So, so particularly your non-essential expenditure and, and all of that kind of stuff. And then aggressively defending any revenue streams that you may still have. I think that that's obviously a, a no-brainer and, and fairly obvious. But something that's, that's becoming a bit of a concern for me in South Africa is food security. Um, uh, Tiger Brands at a shareholder uh, briefing yesterday indicated that they're having significant supply chain challenges getting things like rice and other grains from Southeast Asia and, and, and that kind of stuff into the country. Um, so whilst we haven't quite seen the impact just yet, because, you know, there are a lot of warehouses that are stocked and, and those are sort of very rapidly being depleted, um, our ability to maintain food security in this country is something that's, that's um, something we need to pay attention to. But, but um, you know, I, I think it's, it's really just a case of business um, realigning itself because whilst whilst a company like Tiger Brands is having difficulty getting produce into the country, um, we have a lot of exporters who have produce pretty much uh, rotting away in the harvest, right? And so I think that's sort of the, the, the first type of alignment we need to be looking at. So as much as businesses need to be um, cutting costs and, and protecting revenues, they also need to be using this time to be revisiting their business models and how they operate um, post this. And, and in particularly the, the supply chain um, and what that looks like post this crisis. Um, uh, you know, the, the reality is there's going to be pain. There, that's inevitable. But there are, there are opportunities. You know, if you look at something like retail, for example, um, yeah, of course, all, all the stores are empty. Um, but what has this done for retail home delivery and online shopping and, and all of that kind of stuff? That side of the business literally can't cope with demand at the moment, right? Um, the flip side of that is you've got a lot of, professional drivers, Uber, um, and all of those sort of services, idle and, and unemployed at the moment. And so the, the, the reality is we, we have the tools as business to, to really come together and, and address some of the, the key challenges. Um, but it's going to need business leaders to sort of really, um, you know, we were, we were joking yesterday that the wonderful thing about this new world order is you no longer need pants, right? So you can, you can do things like this and, and you don't need to wear pants. <laughs> but, I, but I do think for, for many entrepreneurs, um, you're going to need to put on your big boy pants and, and um, things are going to get very interesting very quickly. Um, but there are opportunities. And this is really where business leaders need to demonstrate resilience, um, demonstrate innovation and ingenuity and really, you know, evaluate your entire business model, evaluate your entire supply chain. 
um, and start thinking about what the world looks like post this crisis and how you can continue delivering value within that context. And I think the companies and the entrepreneurs that are able to do that the quickest um, will set themselves up very well for, for uh, what is likely to be quite a scary future. Thanks, Ryan. Was that a confirmation you're not wearing trousers or <laughs> but perhaps yes. you are? <laughs> <laughs> Marissa, did you did you did you want to jump in there? I see your hand. Yes, yeah. yeah. I just around the the what are the silver linings um, and what are the opportunities around this? Um, we are working on a big project now where the company is already during this period starting to to plan to mobilize five hundred. Um, expats into Africa and they are using this period now really to do the groundwork and to start preparing everything to be ready um, so they they, they they certainly still some silver linings and projects will go ahead that's, that's great to hear thanks Marissa what, what is what are our, our guests saying Cecilia I think um, I think we we have someone online Johan de Bruyne from task uh, organization um, I'd like to ask you Han um, if you if you want to have a word um, and tell us more about what you are seeing um, from a health perspective what what are the scenarios that I think that you guys are fearing most but then also what is a best case scenario um, how could herd immunity possibly pay out or are we are we maybe placing too much hope on that sometimes what what are you seeing from your perspective? Hi there. Um, just to just to qualify, I'm I'm not a medical doctor. Um, although no. our company does all the all the medical trials and things. Um, at at the moment, we are really worried about the most vulnerable in the society. The guys suffering from HIV, suffering from TB. These guys are not going necessarily to clinics at the moment. They are dropping off regiments. They are. Um, not finishing the um, checkups with the clinics because there's this stigma around going to the clinic at the moment that if you go to the clinic, there's something wrong with you and you might have COVID. Now, while COVID might kill you, something like TB and HIV will kill you. So um, this is a real problem. And, and, and once again, coming back to the first poll where we are worried what's going to happen in 6, 12, 18 months from now in, our, in terms of our larger workforce um, and in the most vulnerable population if we're not going to see the COVID deaths necessarily but we will see other deaths and other illnesses um, having huge impacts and that ripple effect on the economy we won't see yeah. now but we will definitely see that in the future so that, that's one thing that we are, are really worried about. In terms of COVID um, there's a lot of research and then uh, obviously a lot of fake news out there at the moment um, and then our president in uh, the United States isn't helping anybody with with his um, his own brand of scientific medicine that he's uh, following. But uh, I would I would really suggest to all people out there is wait for the proper research papers to come out and just follow whatever the the medical doctors are prescribing at the moment. Um, there is no miracle drug at the moment. I mean, even what we are working on, which has been in the media quite a lot the last week um, on the vaccination, is um, they are promising results, but nothing's been proven yet. Um, and we even see within the medical fraternity, people are losing their heads and they are stockpiling on everything from BCG to chloroquine to everything. And, and this is these are medical people working every day with us that are that are afraid. So, so much more the people sitting at home reading News 24 and CNN and whatever and whatnot. So, I would really suggest people to follow the, the physical distancing, I don't call it social distancing, physical distancing, wash yeah. your hands, keep away from other people, but, but really um, wait for proper medical evidence and proper um, directives to come through. Um, and then just one last thing from my side. Um, so in terms of the lockdown, the WHO did release this week that um, one of their guidelines is a possible step lockdown approach. So we, um, once lockdown is finished, you open it up for a week or two and then you close it down again so that you do have a stepped approach in, in managing the, the outbreak. Um, because without a vaccine, the reality is 
every one of us on this call will get COVID at some point. Um, there's no way around that. But the only way is the lockdown is managing the spread of it and helping our infrastructure to cope. So yeah, that's from that's from my side. Thanks, Johan. And did Amanda, you wanted to say something with, with your scientific medical perspective there? Just to add what Johan's just said, um, we stigmatize very quickly in South Africa. Uh, we have a real tendency to attach stigma to things very, very quickly indeed. And we're also seeing the same thing that they're not necessarily to the same degree, but we stigmatized HIV very quickly. We are prone to doing this. So we're seeing the same tendency applying towards COVID-19. Um, so we've had a very, very careful conversation with our employees. And I think every employer should have that conversation. Um, what it's all about, we've sat them down, we've explained the value virus to them. Um, it's a different kind of SARS. It's not the tax kind. It's, it's the SARS-2 virus. Basically, okay. the SARS-1 virus was capable of doing certain things. It was a little bit of a dumb virus. This virus is much more, much more cheeky about how it behaves. Um, so it goes into your throat first rather than your lungs. And this is how it transmits. Then it works its way down to your lungs. Um, but there are options out there. Um, Sweden is trying herd immunity. They've just been very quiet about it. They weren't as loud as UK was um, in terms of their efforts. And of course, Sweden is a very special country. So you ask the Swedes to do anything, they will do it. <laughs> It's a completely different population. So I think yeah. the solutions for each country are going to be the best solution for each country, if that makes sense. You have to take the population into mind. You yeah. have to take what they will and won't agree to do in mind. But we would say, please, please have a conversation with your employees sooner rather than later about what this virus is, how it operates, how it works. There's a lovely gentleman called Peter Kolchinsky um, who's on Twitter, who's done a beautiful explanation that is nice and easy to understand and hopefully we can knock some of this stigma on the head. Thank you, Amanda. Mm -hmm. And perhaps on, on, on that, perhaps any kind of points from the audience and if not, we can move around with just some closing remarks from each of our panellists. I think, I think we can move on to some closing remarks from each of our panellists. Thank you. Jer Jerry. Some really salient advice there today. And I know we're going to follow up and we're going to ask our members what really resonates, what they want to know more of. And we'll have a, perhaps a, another session that we'll communicate very shortly. But kind of what are your observations, thoughts, feelings coming to the end of this 90 minutes? You have to unmute yourself so we can hear you. <laughs> it, it looks your body language looks very engaged but we can't hear you yeah thank you thank you i tried that uh, i tried to unmute myself but i hit the wrong button um i'm you know i always i always gain from these interactions just to hear other people's perspectives uh, around things and i think that that's what makes this type of forum just just so valuable um it's kind of like our firm we we literally learn something new every single day i think if you if you still have the culture in your business of I know everything and you don't learn something new every single day, then, then, then you're, in, you're going to be in big trouble. Uh, so we're all going to have to obviously undergo some sort of a change. Um, and I think from, from a revenue perspective, I, I certainly hope that we get to see a far more effective and far more aggressive SARS in future. Um, and uh, we, we like that because we like fighting against SARS. Um, I think that, that that's a healthy relationship and space to be. And I just, I just hope we all make it through this. I think, you know, my, my clients, my competitors, even, even SARS, I just, I just really hope we all get through this. You know, you really hope you could wake up 18 months later and, and have learned good lessons and we know we're going to be okay. At, at this stage, it is, it's uncertain, unfortunately. Thanks, Jerry. Mar Marissa? Uh, thanks, Leon. I think from from my side, um, in terms of of large corporates and and multinationals on on the mobility side, there's certainly two things. The, the the one is on on your foreign nationals, and we saw there's a number of 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 members on the on the 
on this forum that have foreign nationals into South Africa, make sure you remain compliant. Those concessions have been made available mm -hmm. and they need to be used. There won't be any excuse for, for, everyone, for anyone not having a valid visa. That, those concessions are available, make sure you use them. And then from a from a new projects perspective or new experts who need to come into the country, do your planning up front. There will be backlog, there will be an influx of applications, there, there will be um, some some difficulties when 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 things start moving again. So the 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 better you plan, the better position you will be in after this to make sure things move forward and your projects can continue. Thank yeah. you, Marissa. And, and Ryan, th thanks so much. Uh, any observations from and conclusions from your perspective at Accelerate? Yeah, look, I mean, it's a, it's a difficult time for everybody. Um, but at the same time, you know, I think most, most entrepreneurs will agree that you never waste a good crisis and potentially there could be a silver lining at, at some other point. Um, but, I, but I think we need, to be, we need to be realistic. I know personally, I, I flip-flop multiple times on a daily basis between, you know, this is an unmitigated disaster and the end of the world as we know it, or this is a fantastic opportunity for a global reset and a, a new world order that perhaps was much needed. Um, and, and, you, you know, you're going you're gonna to flip-flop between those emotions multiple times per day, and, and that's normal. I think for, for many business leaders right now, um, it's important to understand that leadership will most likely be the key differentiator and the, the critical success factor going forward. So you really yeah. need to be resilient, you need to be innovative, you need to be smart, um, and you need to continue motivating and uplifting your, your people. Um, the importance of, of empathy at a time like this is, is absolutely critical as a leader, um, and not only empathy towards others, but also towards yourself. Um, and self-care and, and all of that kind of stuff, you know. So um, it, it's a difficult time. Uh, there's a lot of fear. I think people also need to be aware that fear is often just a response to a lack of control. And so the, the sooner you can start working your business to a point where you feel you have more control, you, you have a better idea of what your future might look like and, and how you're going to deliver value, uh, the better. Um, but, you know, having said that, it's, it's going to be a difficult time. I, I wish all of you all the absolute best. Um, but, but we are in this together, and I, I do believe as a country, we, we have everything we need to, to sort of get through this. Thank, thank you, Ryan. Thank you very much. Sure. And my Vice President Cecilia, any, any concluding thoughts from yourself before I, before I conclude? Um, not, not so much. I think, um, I think it's, it's important to note that we are two-thirds through the um, first official lockdown, and I think so far we've, I think we've done better than a lot of people and certainly than the media <laughs> had hoped and that expected. Um, and I think also, you know, while that doesn't mean we can rest on our laurels and, and, you know, let things slide in any way, I think it's also maybe a good time to say we have done well and you know, just be open to the possibility. I would love to be open to the possibility that maybe we are actually going to defy the curve. Maybe the worst is not going to happen. You know, someone has to be that person. I think, and why not us? Why not us? You know, I think very often these things can play out in a way that no one could have foreseen. When you look back, retrospectively, you might see we missed a couple of factors we weren't aware of. And goodness gracious, it actually turned out so much better for us. I think this just specifically from a virus and infection um, kind of perspective, but but maybe for business too, maybe it is the dawn of a new era, and and we need to seize the opportunity. And um, as Ryan also said, I think it was Churchill that also said that never waste a good crisis. Um, so I'd like to take an optimistic view personally, um, whilst absolutely remaining vigilant um, and open to what's going on there. We can't properly seize any opportunities if we're not aware of the threats or the potential dangers out there. But um, I think equally, let's try and look as hard for the positives and the opportunities in it too. Thanks, Cecilia. And uh, on the Churchill theme, I, I was uh, taken back to his quote after the Battle of El Alamein, which was the turning point in the Second World War, which is perhaps the most comparable global crisis uh, to this. And uh, now is not the end. It is not even the beginning of the end, but it's perhaps the end of the beginning. And that kind of feels pretty prescient in terms of where we are. We know we're in this for a while, so let's, let's bloody get used to it. And I really feel that as a community and as leaders, now is the time we show and earn our mettle. So absolutely, we have to exercise self-care. 
we can control what we eat, how we train, what we read, how we choose to communicate to others. So we can kind of contribute to panic or we can contribute to calm, realistic reason. And that's what I hope we're gonna do as a community here at the Chamber. This is the start of a series and partnership with Expat Web and Tax Consulting and, and hopefully with Ryan, where we can kind of calmly very much share our pain, share our challenges, and collectively within this group, we've got such good intellect networks that there are very few problems we won't be able to solve or contribute to the solving of. And just by being proactive and on the front foot, we're certainly going to feel better about it. I think, again, the lesson as leaders, we really need to make sure we look after ourselves, but we look after our teams and we really embrace this opportunity for innovation because things are going to change. You know, we're going to have to adapt and I don't want to glibly say die. But to do that, we're going to survive and then thrive. And to encourage innovation, we've got to speak to everybody in our organization to say, what do you think? You contribute to where we're taking the business and there's going to be opportunities. So again, I really want to thank you for, for hosting us and sponsoring this event. Ryan, Cecilia, thank you for being on the panel. My team behind the scenes, thank you so much for making it happen. And of course, to our members, we really want to stay connected. Keep talking to us, sign up for our broadcasts, join our next webinar. And of course, look after yourselves and look after each other. And we'll be in touch again very soon. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you again. And uh, we'll catch up after Easter. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks.